What's good, super friends? It's your tío Pepe from the mean streets of Sunlam Park. We've had a few people ask how they could support us and when we're going to set up a Patreon. We've heard all two of you and decided to set one up. Subscriptions suck. Everyone's got subscription fatigue, so we're making ours like I like my women. Sweet, easy, and cheap. It's only $2. That's less than a pack of cigarettes or a coffee at Starbucks. For $2, you'll get our episodes a week early and we'll send you stickers a few times a year. In fact, our first one's already done and it looks super tight. Eventually, we'll add more perks. Link is in the show notes or check us out on patreon.com slash technically a conversation. Cryogenics is a practice of freezing someone who has died in the hopes of reviving them in the future when science and medicine has advanced enough that this would be possible. You've probably heard that Walt Disney was cryogenically frozen and is stored beneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland. But is there any truth to this? With anything that could be considered this strange, there are plenty of myths and legends. Today, we'll go over the Walt Disney cryogenics legend, early attempts at cryopreservation, and some horror stories of early cryonics patients on this episode of Technically a Conversation. Greetings, you're listening to Technically a Conversation, a podcast where we share an interesting topic or story with each other and hope you find it interesting as well. I'm one half of your host, Jose, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Isela. How are you doing today? I am doing pretty good, considering our debacle earlier. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> doing good. Um, I think it's funny that we're just talking about how, oh, we haven't had any tech issues and we had all the tech issues. I know. It was the equivalent of soaring high in the sky and just looking down below. And then like we hit a chunk cloud or something and then it just hits in our, <laughs> a shoe hits our face. <laughs> anyway, but we're here. We made it. Congrats. Yeah. I meant to ask you, actually, are you excited for the Taylor Swift cruise? I didn't know there's a cruise going on. Very awesome for whoever gets to go. Really? I was sure that you had already gotten your tickets by now. <laughs> That's so funny. Unless they're not $100, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> well, I can't believe I'm going to try and sell it to you. Wow. But it's set to leave the Port of Miami on October 21st, 2024. So you still have 11 months. The tickets are only $1,500 to $2,000. So you won't have to sell your organs on the black market or engage in human <laughs> trafficking to afford it. <laughs> the only downside is that Taylor Swift is not expected to attend. But, mm. but you can hang out with other Tay Tay super fans and participate in dress up parties, dancing, and karaoke your favorite Swift songs or swangs, as the real fans call them. They don't call them swangs. You're a liar. That's so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Uh, no, okay, as someone who has gone to a VH1 cruise before, I'm all for it. But I will say the artists were on the actual cruise ship. So that was, it was fun and it was definitely worth it. But it wasn't more than a few hundred bucks. So, you know, it was just like a regular cruise. Wow, that's hardcore right there. Isela, if you want to see the queen, or actually, let me rephrase that. You don't want to see the queen. <laughs> Go <Yeah>. there. <laughs> <laughs> the queen of funflation, you're going to have to spend some money. Ah, well, I saw her and I really didn't spend that much money, thank God. <laughs> but anyway, wow, that's that's pretty cool that there's going to be a cruise. How fun. I thought I would let you know since you're the only Taylor Swift fan that I know. That is very weird because, you know, she's only the I thought of you. highest. <laughs> she's only the highest grossing <laughs> tour. That's very cool. I was actually really excited to tell you about the cruise. No, yeah. I, I think, like I said, that's going to be a lot of fun for whoever <laughs> goes. <laughs> wow, Isela. I thought you were a much bigger Taylor Swift fan. Obviously, I am wrong. As most things, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Keisha. <laughs> now, I don't remember if that's the way you pronounce it or not. It's not. Okay. But 
I don't know if many people are pronouncing her name at all these days. <laughs> no. Hey, but she got to fuck a ghost. How many of us can say that? <laughs> well, honestly, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, oh, wow, it's confession time. Anybody can say that is all I was going to say. <laughs> anyway, you're like, whoa, story time. Yeah. All right. Enough fucking around, Isela. Ready to get started? I am so ready. Great. Let's get started. Okay, since the temperature is starting to get a little cooler, I thought I would talk about a topic that is literally very cool. Ooh. Have you ever heard of Walt Disney? The person who invented Disney? <laughs> yes. Yes. Excellent. What do you know about Walt Disney? I know that uh, he had these big dreams. Um, he felt responsible for his parents' death. He is responsible for all the haunted houses that we see everywhere. I don't know. Amazing customer service. Preach that. <laughs> I don't know. That's about it. <laughs> and coincidentally enough, he was also a big Tay Tay fan. I, I doubt that very much. <laughs> All right. Have you heard any urban legends about Walt Disney? Oh, no, I haven't. This is going to be cool. Okay. So, one urban legend that has always captivated my imagination was the idea that Walt Disney was so obsessed with his own mortality that before he died, he requested that his body be cryogenically frozen no. with the hopes that one day science would advance enough that scientists would be able to revive and repair his body so that he could live again. That is creepy. But I mean, didn't they say that Michael Jackson was trying to do that too? I actually have not heard that about Michael Jackson. Oh, I thought I heard that he, and unless that's like a Mandela effect, <laughs> which everybody go check that one out too. I thought that I had heard that he was like, he was contemplating at least being cryogenically frozen or whatever. I don't know. Is that redundant? I think that's redundant. Anyway. Damn, now I kind of wish I knew about that. So that way I could have researched then. Ah, sorry. <laughs> no problem. The following is from a PBS article by Dr. Howard Market. Link in the show notes. In early November 1966, Walt Disney began to complain of severe neck and leg pain. A chest x-ray uncovered a tumor in his left lung and surgeons recommended the immediate removal of a large portion of the lung. The surgery was performed on November 6th, and while Disney complained about his shortness of breath, the real problem was that the cancer had spread to his lymph nodes and other places of his body. Though Disney attempted to continue working after the surgery, he was rushed to the hospital two weeks later and died of circulatory collapse on December 15th. In early 1967, a few weeks after Disney's death, a reporter for the National Spotlight claimed he had snuck into St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank, where Disney was treated, and saw the deceased Disney suspended in a cryogenic metal cylinder. In 1969, the French magazine E.C. Paris and the National Tattler in the U.S. expanded on these reports, claiming Disney would be thought out in 1975 and was being held in a freezer underneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Are these just urban legends, or is there any truth to these myths? Before we go over this, are you familiar with this story? Not one bit at all. <laughs> Not at all. This is going to be <laughs> this is going to be crazy. <laughs> do you think it's possible that his body could have been cryogenically frozen, or do you believe it's just an urban legend? I think with enough money, it's possible, and he was rolling in it for sure. So I think there's a small possibility. So this is kind of a personal question. Do you think that science will ever advance to the point that we might someday be able to revive someone who's died and their body was frozen immediately after death? I think it just depends on what you mean by revive. I think if you're talking about just the brain, I think we have a better chance for the brain than actually trying to bring your cells back to life. Like once that's done, I think your cell, like, you know, like your skin and all that, I think there's no hope for that. Very interesting. Hold on to that thought because we're actually going to talk a little bit about that. Ooh, cool. Now, I don't remember when I first learned of this story. I feel like I've just always known about it because I've always been a huge fan of strange things. I remember first learning about cryonics around the time that I was in sixth grade. We would go visit my grandma every Sunday and my aunt and uncle who lived there subscribed to Omni Magazine, which talked about a lot of science fiction, the paranormal, French science, and fantasy. The magazines were always in the bathroom. So the moment that I would get to the house, I would go into the bathroom to see if they had gotten a new Omni issue. And I would 
read as much as I could that day. That's awesome. Cryonics and UFOs always seem to be some of their favorite subjects to cover. So, of course, I was hooked. Yeah. Did you ever read Omni when you were a kid? No, but I want, I want to say there was a, a show. I'm not sure if they're related, but it was on some kind of Spanish speaking channel. And they would always, it was like Omni and, you know, they would always talk about just weird topics. Of course, for sure, a ton of UFOs, but also just like weird things in general, you know, possessions and like things like that. So I used to like to watch it. It was like a short thing. It wasn't, uh, I mean, I, I just remember growing up, they would watch that. And my mom like, I mean, my mom still likes to read and learn about stuff like that anyway, in general. So yeah. Is it based off the show? You know what? When I was doing my research, I did see that there was a show, but I don't remember it. So I'm not sure if uh, if it was based on the magazine or if they just copied the name. Oh, got it. Okay. Did you know that the magazine existed? No. I remember when I when I was a little kid and we would go like to Albertsons and stuff, and they would have all the magazines there. I remember they always had like the coolest covers. It was always like some like paranormal thing or or alien thing. Oh, that's really neat. So the covers like would always get me as a kid. Yeah, I think my mom would have totally subscribed to it if she knew about it because. We had gotten, uh, we would order all those uh, Mysteries of the Unexplained. Uh, there's books and, you know, Reader's Digest. And I mean, although I guess Reader's Digest had like more credible stuff. <laughs> but she always had those, you know, mysteries type of things going on. Yeah. The Mysteries of the Unknown were excellent. I loved those books. I read all of them cover to cover. Yeah. Omni Magazine, I think they stopped publishing it like in the 90s or something. Hmm. Or else I would probably be subscribed today. <laughs> so let's go ahead and define cryonics for those that might not be familiar with the term. According to Merriam-Webster, cryonics is the practice of freezing a person who has died of a disease in hopes of restoring life at some time when a cure for that disease has been developed. Also, I noticed that some of the sources used cryonics and cryogenics interchangeably. I am also guilty of doing that, especially since I want to say that I first learned the term as cryogenics. The correct term for cryopreservation is cryonics. Cryogenics is the study of cryonics. Mm. And I attempted to go back and fix all my notes, uh, but in case I missed it and didn't catch it while we're recording this, that's the difference. Okay. And uh, were you familiar with the concept of uh, cryonics, Cicela? I thought they were the same thing. So that's good to know that the genics part is the study and the preservation is the cryonics part. So that's really good to know. I, it was always one of those like, what's the difference? You know. <laughs> but you were familiar with cryonics and that it was actually a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know there's one out in Phoenix. It's in Scottsdale, actually. Oh, yeah. And we're going to talk about that one. Yeah. Oh, exciting. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from the National Spotlight, E.C. Paris and the National Tattler, which were all described as tabloids by PBS, reporting on Disney being cryogenically frozen in the late 1960s, Two Walt Disney biographies also ran with this story. The first being Disney's World, released in 1986 by Leonard Mosley, and Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince, released in 1993 by Mark Elliott. There were also several former Disney employees during the 90s that claimed that Disney's body was indeed frozen. But according to David Mickelson from Snopes.com, these employees have been discredited. Both biographies that state that Disney was cryogenically frozen have also been discredited and are riddled with several factual errors and undocumented assertions. Mm. Elliot in particular claims that Disney often spoke about the notion of having himself frozen with his brother Roy, but there is no record of Roy ever speaking with Walt about this and no source as to where this information was obtained was ever found in Elliot's notes. Mosley's biography stated that Disney was pleased that the part of his diseased lung that was removed would be preserved in case surgeons needed to treat it before putting it back where it belonged. Mm. While it is true that sample tissue removed during cancer surgery is preserved, it's stored in formaldehyde, which would preserve it only for microscopic study, but damage the tissue biologically. In other words, these samples could never be put back. Mm. Mosley also claimed that close colleagues and advisors of Disney had spoken to him about cryonics. It was later discovered that these close colleagues were indeed employees of the Disney organization, but had never spoken personally to Disney about this subject. 
they were just repeating the same urban legends everyone has heard. In 1972, Disney's daughter Diane wrote, quote, There is absolutely no truth to the rumor that my father, Walt Disney, wished to be frozen. I doubt that my father had ever heard of cryonics. So what do you think? That sounds pretty definitive, no? It seems pretty definitive. Uh, I mean, I think it's just always a good sell. You know, the title of the book that you mentioned, that one Disney's Dark Prince or whatever. That sounds <laughs> that sounds pretty <laughs> ominous. I think that would sell a lot just because of the, the title. Oh, it's possible that, you know, could have just been made up. Yeah, that definitely sounds super metal. Yeah. I hope that the day that I die, I'm known as Jose, podcast Dark Prince. Oh, that's better than <laughs> what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say <laughs> Sunland Park's Dark Prince. <laughs> <laughs> Sunland Park's biggest asshole. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> you don't know everybody there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> true, true. Right, so if that's not enough to put that theory to rest, no pun intended, <laughs> Disney family members have confirmed that cremation was Walt's wish. Disney's death certificate shows that he was cremated two days after his death. The death certificate has a name, license number, and signature of the embalmer and belonged to a real embalmer employed at the Forest Lawn Mortuary at the time. The Disney estate also paid Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glensdale 40 thousand dollars for interment property and there is a marked burial plot for walt disney where his ashes are kept and in case you were wondering forty thousand dollars is a few bucks short of three hundred and eighty thousand twenty twenty three dollars wow wow that's a lot i know can you imagine that shit three hundred and eighty thousand dollars just to have your ashes stored there fuck that right bury my ashes in the backyard underneath the dog shit where i belong whoa jesus that's so <laughs> rough. <laughs> i don't think i'd put you there <laughs> but yeah that i agree that's way too much i told my daughter like she's just gonna do like the whole little confetti everywhere like you know and then i'm gonna be in trans mountain or like then i'm gonna little part of me in uh you know chico sacos or <laughs> That kind of thing. I don't think I've ever told this to anybody. Uh oh, it's confession time, everybody. Yeah. When my grandma passed away, well, she wanted to be cremated, and her wish was for her remains to be used because she had like a garden. Mm -hmm. So she wanted her remains to be scattered there where the garden was. So each of us kind of got like a handful of um of the ash and like spread it. Oh. When it was my turn to do that, as I was opening my hand to let go of the of the ash, like a little breeze came up. Oh, my. And blew some of the ash into my mouth. Wow. Okay. She is in you, with you all the time now. <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually. That is pretty cool. She wanted to be with you. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I read a laugh. Yeah, I could see how that would be, like, startling, but trying to reframe it in a positive way. It could actually be a nice thing. Um, I was kind of shook. To quote uh, what you talked about in the last podcast. Yes. yes. <laughs> I could see why. <laughs> right. Well, enough of my personal trauma. <laughs> Going back to Walt Disney, would you say that you're pretty satisfied that he was not cryogenically frozen and is not being stored under the Pirates of the Caribbean right in Disneyland? I think it would be really hard for him to be stored under there. But like I said, with a lot of money, a lot of crazy things can be done. And anybody can just forge a signature. Who knows who this guy is? He probably could have been paid off too. You know, there's so many options for both sides. So I wouldn't say that I'm completely convinced, but I guess I would need to know more that he was really into this, you know, cryogenics like he was really learning about it and like thinking this is feasible for him we should break into disneyland and go look <laughs> underneath the pirates of the caribbean right <laughs> no one will ever notice yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i actually don't believe that he was cryogenically frozen that's my personal opinion i'm kind of surprised that you're keeping that possibility open i mean i think it's possible but like i said i think it would be really hard with a lot of money, I mean, crazier shit's probably been done before. That's very true. So I guess it's possible. But not likely. Yeah, all the evidence points to it not being likely. Right, yeah. So 
let's talk about some people that were frozen and some of the very unfortunate and grisly mishaps that happen with some of their bodies after we return from this quick commercial break. Cool. Do you have trouble sleeping or suffer from insomnia or anxiety? Are you a fan of horror and scary stories? Then give Scary Bedtime Stories a shot. I'll give you a calming background to drown out the neighbor's dog or that douchebag on the bike or muscle car that's overcompensating. Every episode, I'll read some pages from a horror classic. Put the episode on repeat or make a playlist and let me be your Morpheus, your guide into the realm of dreams. My voice will never get louder than this. The music will never get louder than this. There will be no loud and obnoxious ads to awaken you from your slumber. If you want to go to sleep, if you need to go to sleep, check out Scary Bedtime Stories on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or check out scarybedtimestories.com. Flip that pillow to the cool side, relax your breathing, and come with me to dreamland while enjoying a horror classic. scarybedtimestories.com Do you love true crime, but are looking for something different? Do you like learning about cases so off the wall they can't possibly be true? Do you love history, but want to hear about what they didn't teach you in school? Do you like laughing awkwardly about cases that are bizarre and a little strange? Then we have the podcast for you. Join me, Lindsay. And me, Madison, for Yield Crime where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. Listen every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. And we're back. And we're back, everybody. Were you cryogenically frozen during our break, Isela? And thought out. Can you believe it? No <laughs> mishaps here. <laughs> oh, great. Because we're going to talk about a lot of mishaps. <laughs> I love mishaps when they don't happen to me. <laughs> oh, you're, you're going to love the second part of this episode then. Oh, gross. Okay. <laughs> so now that you know a little bit about cryonics, what do you think? Is this something that you would want done to you when you pass away? No. Not one bit, even if they do say it's possible. I think there's a natural course. And if I if I graduate to the next level, whatever that is, like, don't hold me back. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to level up, you know, eventually in my time. <laughs> yeah. Is this something you would be interested in? No, not at all. Is it something that you've ever considered? No, I've seen there was uh, some kind of documentary. I can't remember what it was, but they had a person and they tried to restore like her head, I guess what she looked like a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was basically talking like a robot and, you know, this is, this is how I now talk. And it was like weird. And I, I just was not really having it. Like, I'm sure you miss that person, but I don't think that's really the right way to try to keep them here. Oh shit. I didn't know that we were going to be talking like robots. I changed my answer. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's it. That's the selling point right there. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. No, that, that's not something that I've considered. Just because I don't think that it'll be possible. I don't know. May, maybe, you know, there's been weirder things that have happened with the advancement of technology. But as of right now, I don't think that it's possible. Yeah. But if it, if it was possible, would you be down? What I would love to see is I would love to to see where we are in a hundred years, like to wake up one day and like have like one day, you know, to just like wander around the whatever's left of this world and just see like, oh fuck, man, we really fucked up or be like, oh wow, we, we managed to turn things around. Things are magnificent. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I would want to be alive more than a day because at that point, everybody that I've ever loved is gone. So I think it would be very lonely, you know, knowing, you know, my siblings are not around. My parents are not around. I don't know. Humans are very resilient and I'm sure that I would be able to cope, but I don't think that I would feel right living in a different time period. Yeah, I agree. I think that would make for a very lonely existence just to kill curiosity. Yeah. 
But I, I do wish that I could see what the world was, is going to be like in a hundred years, in a thousand years, just to see how we've advanced or how much we've fallen from where we're at right now. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if it's going to be like the scene out of, what was it, LCM or something like that, where <laughs> Matt Damon's trying to leave Earth and only the rich people get to leave Earth or whatever it was. I don't know. I mean, I think that's what Elon Musk is trying to do. So oh, God. <laughs> that, that might end up happening. <laughs> All right, so had you not answered no, I think that some of these stories I'm about to share with you would make you reconsider. Mm. The following is from a Big Think article by Tom Hartsfield. While cryopreservation is considered a legitimate science and does occur in nature, it's only successful in limited cases. And I think that you talked about one case in our zombies episode where certain frogs can be frozen solid and when they thaw out, it's like nothing had ever happened. Cryonics, on the other hand, is widely considered pseudoscience. Humans are very difficult to preserve because when deprived of oxygen at room temperature, the brain dies within minutes. While the body may be reanimated, the person would be in a permanent vegetative state. During brain or heart surgery, circulation may be stopped for up to one hour with the body cooled at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius. There is research on preserving the brain without oxygen for longer while the body is cooled for 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius, but is still in the experimental research stage. The moment a cryonics patient dies, the race is on to cool the body before decomposition starts and place it in a douar, which Hartsfield describes as a thermos bottle full of liquid nitrogen. The body or bodies are wrapped in insulating material attached to a stretcher and suspended in liquid nitrogen head first to keep the brain the coldest and most stable. One of the first attempts at cryonics was out of a cemetery in Chatsworth, California by Robert Nelson in the late 1960s. His four initial clients were not frozen in liquid nitrogen, however, and were instead placed on a bed of dry ice in a mortuary. The son of one of the bodies decided to take his mother's body back and hauled her around in a pickup truck on dry ice before burying her. Now, as you can imagine, the mortician wasn't thrilled about having a bunch of bodies just lying around on dry ice. So a Dewar capsule with liquid nitrogen was secured for the other remaining three bodies. The only problem was that there was already a body in the Dewar. The body was taken out and Nelson and the mortician spent the entire night trying to figure out how to jam the four bodies in the Dewar. It's unknown if any of these bodies suffered damage from thawing. This was described as a puzzle, but eventually they were able to figure out how to cram them all in, and the sealed capsule was lowered into an underground vault at the cemetery. Nelson claimed that he would occasionally refill the capsule with liquid nitrogen for about a year until he stopped receiving money from relatives. After a while, he just let the body thaw out inside the capsule, festering in his vault. Gross. Oh my God. I really shudder to think how he made them all fit. Like, was there some you know, things going on, like slicing and dicing? That I, I really don't know. And I guess that guy was kind of smart to rescue his mother's corpse, right? Although riding around <laughs> in a pickup truck with your mother's corpse lying on top of dry ice can't be great either. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's a good look. <laughs> no. Can't imagine it. It'll smell great. Oh, gross. Yeah. Going back to the puzzle thing, I can just imagine them doing like a game of Tetris with the bodies. Oh, I know. To, to, to fit in there. Yeah, that sounds atrocious. Like, can you imagine? They're like, hurry, trying and like, <laughs> jumping on the lid or something. They're thawing out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Like, she touched me. Oh. <laughs> oh my god oh i don't even want to imagine that and they're like all moist from oh no no <laughs> i know i know but then you also have to think like if they're directly on dry ice you know how you get that like uh almost like a, a frostbite where like the freezer burn type of thing the hands probably all black and oh my god mm, <laughs> it no, no, just no. sounds <laughs> that definitely paints a picture <laughs> i wish i could say it gets better oh there was another group of three bodies including an eight-year-old girl that were packed into a second duar and placed in the Chatsworth vault. Oh, no. 
the liquid nitrogen system failed without Nelson noticing. When he randomly checked the Dewar one day, he noticed the three bodies had long thought out. <gasps> it's unknown what the fate of these ruined bodies was, but Hartsfield believes they might have been refrozen for several more years. Oh my goodness. We're going to start getting to some of the gruesome stuff. What? I thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Wait. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Nelson froze a six-year-old boy in 1974. Oh my God, they're getting younger. What's happening? <laughs> okay. I think that people were just, this was starting to become something that people were aware of. So right. yeah, I think naturally parents who lost their kids at a very young age, I want to say Nelson died of leukemia. Mm. So um, parents that lose their kids at a very young age, they're, they're perhaps hopeful that a cure could be found in their lifetime and they could be reunited with their children. Right, right. So I think that's why these are getting younger. Yeah, that does make sense. All right. So the Dewar was well maintained by the boy's father, but when it was opened, the boy's body was found to be cracked, which might have occurred from freezing the body too quickly. And I kind of imagine it being like a windshield where it just spider webs, but it's still in the same shape and everything. Mm. The boy's body was thawed, embalmed, and buried. And since Nelson had a recently vacated Dewar, a different man was placed in the capsule, but the body had already been dead for 10 months and was severely decomposed. <gasps> so it was eventually thawed. Every cryonics attempt that was in Nelson's care eventually failed, and ultimately, the bodies were just left in the Dewar capsule to rot. Oh. Reporters who visited this failed cryonics facility reported a horrifying stench. Oh. Nelson admitted the failure was due to bad decisions and going broke. It's pretty sad, huh? Because, I mean, ultimately, th these are all people that were loved ones, you know? Yeah, this is definitely, like, they were people. And it doesn't feel like they were really treating them with the, I mean, maybe the intention was there, but, oh, that sounds, uh, I, it's bad enough you have to see your loved one embalmed, but to embalm them after they've, their body's been cracked open, oh my God, that sounds atrocious. Yeah, that is awful. I saved the best for last. Okay. <laughs> I'm only wincing a little bit. <laughs> the most ghastly of all these failures happened in an underground vault in a cemetery in Butler, New Jersey. The Dewar was poorly designed and the pipes were uninsulated, leading to numerous incidents. One time, the bodies in the container partially thawed, moved, and froze again, sticking to the capsule. Kind of like, like when a little kid... Um, they try and lick a metal pole or something and then their tongue sticks. Imagine that, but it's like a whole body. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. So the bodies had to be entirely thawed to unstick and be refrozen again. A year later, the Dewar completely failed and the bodies decomposed into, quote, a plug of fluids <gasps> at the bottom of the capsule. Oh, wow. The decision was made to thaw out the entire God forsaken monstrosity, scrape out the remains and bury them. Think about that job when you think your job sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, people. That's, that's nasty. A plug of fluids is the way that it was described. A plug, dude. Once you say plug, oh, well, wow. That's so revolting. <laughs> Oh my God, I shouldn't be laughing at, about this, but I know it's so awful. It is really awful. Of all the bodies that were frozen prior to 1973, only one remains. Hmm. That's the body of Robert Bedford, who was sealed in a Dewar in 1967. But rather than leaving it in Nelson's carnival of horror and poor decisions, or the Butler Cemetery to turn into a revolting flesh sludge that would later need to be scraped off of the bottom of the capsule. Bedford's family actually took meticulous care of it at their own expense and now resides at Alcor, which is a modern cryogenics facility with researchers looking for ways to improve the freezing process. I have to read this word for word to you. Quote, at a more fundamental level, it appears to be stable and to have deep pockets, so there is a better chance that your corpse will be around long enough for some distant future doctor to recoil in horror at it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> to recoil? <laughs> 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 
Even they're telling you it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty, folks. That's awful because I feel like my body would send someone recoiling without the deep pockets and the cryogenics <laughs> or the cryonics. <laughs> Shut your mouth, girl. No, I mean, if I was dead. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, A, the self-deprecation is my bag. Nice. <laughs> that's funny. But yeah, that's really poetic and lovely in the most morbid of ways, huh? <laughs> yes. You know, bodies are going to do that regardless, frozen or not. <laughs> Dead bodies will do that. So <laughs> save yourself some money. Yeah. Well, this would be the doctor that would recoil in horror at, at your dead body. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want that? <laughs> and again, chef's kiss, Mr. Hartfield. Chef's kiss for giving us that amazing line. <laughs> so the preservation process has also advanced considerably from the days that your body was laid on a block of dry ice or when you were tetris in a vat of liquid nitrogen with three other bodies. Alcor, for example, states that they have a multi-step process to prepare the body for storage. This includes cooling the body while anti-clogging agents and organ preservation solutions are pumped into your bloodstream. The body is then taken to their facility where the fluids used earlier are replaced with chemicals that turn your organs to glass. This is done with the intention of cutting down on damage to the organs during the cooling and storage process. The body is then placed in a Dewar capsule. So I guess they're never going to get rid of those dewars, huh? I Yeah, I guess not. But I, I don't understand how turning your organs to glass is going to help anything. Because don't you still need some flexibility when it's thawed out? That part, I don't understand that well either. But I am going to talk about a few more, um, I guess, kind of horror stories. Oh. So maybe when we get to that, we could see why they might have had that reasoning to turn the organs into glass. Sure. Now, I know you were curious, Isela. <laughs> According to the Alcor website, should you be interested in becoming a member? That's what they call it. You can have your whole body preserved for only $200,000 or just your head for $80,000. However, that's not counting membership dues that are paid annually and like life insurance, increase with age. This is currently $60 for minors, $200 for 18-year-olds, and for everyone else, it's your age times $15. <gasps> Interesting. So a lot of people probably opt for the head. Come on. Yeah, it's cheaper. That's all you need anyway. I didn't take care of this body later anyway. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> My body is trash. It's not even going to be uh, worth because I'm a donor, so it's not even going to be worth for them to harvest it for my organs. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word you were using earlier? It's caca. <laughs> it, yeah, my body is caca. <laughs> no, it's, not. it's not. Oh, wow. Okay. That's good to know. Who's got the deep pockets for 200000 then? That's crazy. That's cheap. What? That's like going to, what, like 10 Taylor Swift concerts. Guys, <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> okay. So going back to the prices... $200 for 18-year-olds, and for everyone else, it's your age times $15. So if you're 40 when you sign up, it would cost you an additional $600 a year in membership fees. There is also a standby fee. If you're pretty sick and you know that you're not long for this world, you can pay $40,000 to have Alcor members at your bedside to preserve you the moment that you die. This includes stabilization and transport, cryoprotection, cool down, long-term maintenance, and revival. Wow. However, if you choose to relocate to a hospice or a temporary home near Alcor, which is in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, they will provide relocation assistance of up to $10,000, which is kind of sweet considering you'll be paying a minimum of $80,000 plus however much you've paid in annual membership fees up until that point. Jeez. Yeah, so relocation is one less thing that you have to worry about, Isela. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's like a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Scottsdale is the most expensive place. Oh, my gosh. Or it's it's a pretty expensive place as far as the Phoenix area is concerned. Yeah. It's really nice, though. It is. It's very pretty. <laughs> oh, like I was mentioning, Alcor has an option to have only your head preserved. The thought here is that if science ever advances to the point where they can revive you, maybe they might be able to create a new body for you and transfer your brain. Or maybe put your brain in a robot 
like your general grievous or something. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but now that you brought up the talking like a robot, I, I think I'd be down for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be so weird to see see your personality in another person's body. It just would freak me the fuck out. Like, no, that's not okay. No, well, anything's better than what I was born with, so. Don't be quiet. I would welcome that. <laughs> <laughs> be quiet. That's so weird. Yeah, I think that would be so weird. And imagine you, your brain, and now you have to identify as this new person. Maybe that new person can't even grow a beard. Maybe they're bald. But maybe they're handsome, so they don't need to grow out a beard. <laughs> and oh, I think it's so strange. You know, I can always get hair plugs like Elon Musk. Oh my God, does he have hair plugs? That's yeah. so funny how much you know about him. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of these days I will do an episode because he's one of the most rotten human beings. <laughs> Lovely. Stay tuned for that rotten human being. <laughs> I had a way to sell it. <laughs> the only redeeming factor of him is that he dated... Um, Amber Heard. Oh my God, he did it. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the only redeeming factor of him. Oh, wow. In 1983, Alcor needed to separate three bodies from their heads. So they had a rare opportunity to study the bodies and see how they held up while preserved in the best case scenarios. Since the bodies were frozen, the heads had to be delicately removed from the body using a chainsaw. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Once the heads were severed and put away, Alcor employees got to work thawing the bodies to perform medical examinations. See how they held up. Mm. Would you like to take a guess at what they discovered? Well, what kind of medical examinations are we talking about? I, I don't know what we're talking about. Uh, well, they just wanted to see how these bodies had held up being frozen, mm. being in, a, in liquid nitrogen. See if the organs were still in good order, the, the tissue was in good order, the circulatory system. I'm going to guess that the organ itself is in decent order, but the tissues might have been uh, not in the best condition. Let's see if you're right. That was fair. At first, the bodies looked like they were in good shape and only showed moderate cracking in a few places. What? Once the bodies thawed, it was a different story. Cracks appeared in the warming bodies, cutting the layers of skin and fat all the way down to the muscle beneath. Oh, could I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> One member displayed red traces across the skin where the blood vessels had ruptured. Mm. The internal damage was even more extensive. Nearly every organ had fractured. I'm not a doctor, but that doesn't sound great. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Call me crazy. That does not sound like that's going to be good in your afterlife. No. Nope. I mean, who needs a spleen, right? You just need your, <laughs> just need your brain. <laughs> yep. And I think going back to what you were asking about why they put the chemicals in there to turn the organs into glass, I think it's to prevent stuff like this happening. Mm, okay. So uh, a different one of the members had major blood vessels near the heart completely broken. Mm. The heart and spleen were almost bisected and the intestines were fractured extensively. Wow. Only the liver and kidneys weren't completely destroyed. The third member, Isela, which had been thawed very slowly, looked pretty good externally, but was the worst internally. Gosh. The organs were all badly cracked and severed. The spinal cord was snapped into three pieces, huh. and even the heart was fractured. Oh. They injected dye into an artery in the arm to study the circulatory system, but most of it pulled under the skin and leaked out of the skin fractures. Oh, gross. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One thing of note, there have been cases where families will go to court to demand your body from Alcor to be thawed and buried. So even if your wish is to be cryogenically frozen, once you're dead, there is no guarantee that your family will respect your wishes. There are plenty of horror stories of this, but uh, the one that is most notable is a Norwegian man that was stored in a California facility that worked with Alcor. And since this one's the most notable one, I thought that we would end on a on a high note, on a happy note here. Oh, wow. Okay. The Norwegian man's daughter had the frozen body removed and was stored in an ice shed behind their house in Colorado. The body was discovered when she was evicted from her property. Every year, the small town of Nederland 
Colorado has a celebration called Frozen Der Guy Day to celebrate or whatever you would call that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do you think, Isala? Hearing these stories, does it inspire confidence in you to seek out cryogenics as your final wish? Not one bit. I think that we need to be okay with the choices we make, which is why it's important to think before we say or react or act and just live with it. On our last dying breath, hopefully we amended what we could. This is it. That's it. We get to level up and whatever, whatever you believe is going to happen. You don't believe in anything. Congratulations. Nothing happens. I don't know. I think we need to be okay with it. I think you're right. Yeah. Wow. I guess it's too late for me, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you should have made good choices to begin with. You have made great choices. Thank you. Yes. Now, before we end the episode, special shout out to our patron, Sophia, for helping to support the show. Yay! If you would like to support us, get our episodes ad-free and a week early. Check us out on patreon.com slash technically a conversation. Yeah, yeah. With all that out of the way, we hope that you enjoy the show and you join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review, tell a friend, and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are sold. Yes. Follow us on the socials at GreetingsTAC, email us at GreetingsTAC at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669. If you have a story to share with us about that time you froze your pinky <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. but rather than leaving it in nelson's carnival of horror and poor decisions or the butler cemetery to turn to a revolting flesh sludge that would later need to be scraped off the bottom of a capsule <laughs> <laughs> so gross. sorry i need to That's re-say so that <laughs> yeah you probably should <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going full synonym dictionary on this to try and come up with different ways of saying this shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me try it again. But rather than leaving it in Nelson's carnival of horror and poor decisions, or the butler cemetery to turn into a revolting flesh sludge that would later need to... <laughs> <laughs> You're so sick. Flesh sludge. Oh my God. That's so cruel. <laughs> I don't know if I could say it without laughing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm just glad it, the synonym wasn't like slurpy or something. I actually, I actually like. Yeah. No, I was looking at several things. I was like, how can I make the sound? Put a little bit of swagger. The most gruesome. Yeah. <laughs> On next week's episode of Technically a Conversation. This half man, half goat comes once a year around what you and I refer to as Christmas, chasing naughty children and sometimes even dragging them to hell. In early December, the kids in Austria get ready for the arrival of good old Saint Nick and be rewarded with gifts or treats. If they're good, of course, but if they were bad, well, they can expect more than just a lump of coal. They can expect Krampus. When there is good, there's always bad. And European versions of St. Nicholas have long had their villainous counterparts such as Belschnickel and Necht Ruprecht, who carry out punishment. Krampus is just another representation of St. Nick's scary counterpart that originates from folklore in Austria's Alpine region. Krampus has been scaring young kids and amusing sick individuals for hundreds of years. <laughs> New episodes drop Monday. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show.